Hello and welcome to On The Rocks, a fans podcast where we discuss all things BRTFC and I'm your host Liam Goodley. This podcast and our media team are sponsored by Mitchell's Travel. Call Mitchell's Travel today on 01243 939 555 and quote Rocks 1883 to get a great deal and help the football club in the same process. Mitchell's Travel are proud sponsors of On The Rocks. Today on the show I'm pleased to be joined by Horsham and former Bognor defender David Ray. Thanks for joining me, David. How are you? Absolute pleasure. No, um, yeah, I'm good, thank you. Not too bad. Um, hoping to, to get back on the pitch as soon as possible. But um, but no, we're doing all right. Thank you, mate. Yeah, so there's been no games recently for Horsham. Uh, in, 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 I've only just gone back for cup games, but I don't know if there was any games that Horsham have been playing recently. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, um, with, with the lockdown on this uh, this occasion, is this we, we had what a, about a month off, um, and and just sort of started venturing back in now. Um, we had a game on on Tuesday night against South Park, um, but um, but no, we've been very limited as to what we can do, um, obviously due to the the rules and regulations. But um, you know, I think at the moment it's it's important we all do our bit for the the bigger picture in the world. But, um, but yeah, certainly uh, not just fans, but players are, are itching to get back out on the pitch, that's for sure. Yeah, certainly. And uh, in general then, how, how has it been for you during this pandemic? Obviously, we went, we've just been hit by another second uh, second lockdown in, in um, November to December, beginning of December. Uh, how has it been so far without the football and returning for September for just like just under two months and then having to go in lockdown again? How has that been for you? Yeah, I, th- I think it's been really difficult um, in, in a lot of ways because um, and I think you've probably seen a, a lot of clubs, in, including um, us at Horsham and I've fallen foul to it myself. Um, you know, a lot of injuries have been picked up where, you know, lads have maybe been doing their own fitness work. But um, but obviously straight line running and, and different bits and bobs when you're on your own, you, you can't replicate football. Um, and, and, you know, coming back into after the, the long lo- initial lockdown, um, coming back into to training and games are coming thick and fast and everything else, a lot of injuries have been picked up. And it's, it's been hard because you've been at, you, you get knocked out of routine. And I think most footballers um, at any level, really, um, you know, most footballers, they, they do like a bit of routine, um, you know. So it's, it's been quite hard from that sense. Um, you know, I, I think this one, in truth, this one's probably not been quite as difficult because, one, it's not been as long. Um, and, and two, obviously, I, I think the world in general, the country in general um, on this lockdown hasn't been quite as restricted um, as, as we all were or certainly as we all felt um, on the first long lockdown. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been difficult. I, so I think missing that routine um, has, has been the difficult thing. Um, most players, I think, these days, most players players will keep themselves ticking over in best shape they can. But, but like I say, you, you can't you can't replicate football on your own. Um, and and you know we all, we all love the game. That's why we're involved in it. So um, it's been a big miss. Yeah, it certainly has. And um, yeah, it must be difficult for the players to come back after having no training and <laughs> just going straight into like one week's worth of training and then going straight back into a match. I think Bogner just experienced it, experienced that recently before we played Tame the other day. Uh, Tame United in the FA Trophy. I think they had one training training session before going back into the yeah. football. So it must have been difficult. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, we, I think everybody, football is such a popular game and everybody plays it. You know, you, you drive past on a nice day and you see dads and kids in the park kicking a ball around. You, you see, you know, amateur footballers out playing. You, you, everywhere you go, you see people playing football and you see football pitches. Um, and I think because of that and because we, we kind of got that culture in this country where football is such a, a major thing, um, I, I think you're expected to literally just pick up where you left off. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's not quite that simple and that straightforward. And, and football, it is a, it's a game of repetition, same as everything. The more you do it, the better you get, the more consistent you become in terms of fitness. Like I say, you can go out and run 5Ks and you can run 10Ks and... And, and all the rest of it. But you, you just cannot replicate football movements unless you're playing football. Um, and with these lockdown rules, we, we, everyone's been so limited, um, you know, as to, to how much football they can play. Yet there's a lot of fixtures yet to be completed. So 
you know, there's only so much standing still you can do uh, before the games start coming in thick and fast. And, you know, it's going to take most players three, four, five, six games even to, to sort of start getting back into their stride. Um, but, you know, I suppose it's difficult, like for Bogner coming back against Tame in, into a cup fixture, um, you kind of get thrown in the deep end. Um, but in terms of the league season with everyone else, if they're not involved in cup, I, I guess most are in the same boat. So, um, you know, it kind of evens it out a little bit. Yeah, it certainly does. And obviously Bogner are through to the next round. They play Malden and Tiptree uh, next Tuesday. Uh, that was a 5-2 win. A, a great test from Tame United that other day. But uh, David, you most recently represented Horsham in defence against Bogner, where the Rocks ended up narrowly winning 1-0. But it looks like they have yep. given you an opportunity at Horsham getting involved with the coaching at the club as well. What are the main responsibilities yeah. you have in this role with the Hornets? Yeah, so I mean, I mean to be truthful, it's, it's not, um, you know, they've, they've got a great management team at Horsham that, that have had a lot of success over recent years. Um, you know, and, and I'm new to the club. I'm, I'm new to the people at the club. Um, you know, it wasn't a case of I knew them previously. I've, I've sort of gone in. Um, and, and sort of met them as, as joining. Um, and I, I think it's just a case, you know, I've, I've been around the non-league game for, for quite a while now. Um, and, and I think it was seen by Dom, uh, the, the, the manager over there, that, you know, I'd be able to offer some of my experience to the younger lads and, and just kind of assist a little bit in, you know, my experiences, like I say, of, of the clubs have been out, I've played for some, some great non-league managers um, over the last 19 years, um, and and with some with some superb players that I've you know you'd like to think that you you've picked up a bit along the way, and I think Dom sort of recognised that, and and it was it was an opportunity for me really to to make that first step um, towards the, the coaching management side of the game without huge responsibility. So you know I, I sort of act more. Um, in a, just sort of a senior player role amongst the lads. So I, I offer my experience and, and opinions. And, and then, you know, I'm included within the management team group at Horsham where we discuss, you know, all things tactically, opponents coming up, um, you know, opinions on previous performances, um, you know, and, and basically just given a little bit of a voice and opinion uh, with with Dom um, and and the rest of the management team to... To kind of, you know, hopefully, like I say, just just give my little bit to to help us perform better in the in the next game. Um, oh. So it's, it's, I'm not sort of at the moment I'm not jumping in too much on the on the training field, looking to take sessions and stuff. You know, Jimmy Punter as a young coach and then he he does a great job along with Dom. Um, obviously, we've just got um, Adam Westwood back as as assistant, who's you know he's got you can already see. Um, within the last couple of days, you know, his skill set is, is going to be a, a different approach, but something that's going to benefit us. Um, so it's just blending in and and kind of helping and dipping in and out, really, rather than leading sessions, um, especially as I'm I'm currently still playing. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult if you're still playing to be taking sessions as well. So, um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the role, really, like I say, um, adding nice. a, a little bit of experience to to the team and, so and more of an advisory a, role really in, in terms well, of well I think you're yeah. probably bridging bridging between the management team and, and the players maybe yeah um, bridging and, that gap there is some yeah, I suppose yeah, there is a that gap. yeah yeah so I, I suppose there so, is a bit and, of a gap I, between the two isn't there yeah and I, I think maybe just um you know an experienced opinion um sort of within the management team as well and I, I think you know as I say I'm, I'm new to the club so I'd, I'd, I hope and, and I'd like to think um, that you know, over the coming months, it, it would be something that that progresses, and I might start getting involved in taking certain parts of sessions, and um, you know, once, once I sort of get ideas, because as you, as we mentioned with the, with the virus and, and everything, it's it's been so stop start so far um, that you know, being new to the club, um, it, it's been difficult to to you know get a, a little bit of, of rhythm and, and routine. But you know, as as it all hopefully we we kick on. Um, over the next few weeks, we can get going again. We all hope and, and kick on. And like I say, in, in a couple of months' time, then you know I'm, I might be dipping in and, and taking bits of sessions here and there. Oh, yeah, sounds good, uh, David. And the new uh, we obviously saw the new 3G pitch over the past couple of years uh, at the stadium there at Horsham. It's fairly impressive. Uh, in the, is the surface there as good as they say it is? And 
is there much give when going for sliding tackles as 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 taking the ball uh, on the on the pitch on uh, taking a fall on the pitch? Yeah, I, I think um, obviously the the three G four G surfaces they're becoming more and more popular for for obvious reasons, uh, particularly like around non league, um, particularly sort of conference south and down. Um, and and I must admit that the the surface over at Horsham. Um, it, it probably is one of the better ones um, around. I, th I think the time of which it was laid, um, I think, you know, in, in terms of the grading, I, I think it was one of the better ones available. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a great surface um, to, to play on. It, it's not um, it's not so bad. I mean, you, you look, you would look at it from the side and you'd think artificial and you'd think, you know, burns and grazes and, and bit of a hard surface to fall on but in truth it, it's not really any different than playing pre-season and early season and late season when you know if you get a bit of nice weather and the grass pitches are, are firm and they've not been watered or whatever um you know it's, it's not too dissimilar really so it's um it's okay and I think you find as well uh, um to be truthful when when you get a surface like that um players tend to to, to go to ground less um, and it does change, I believe, it changes the, the style of the game a little bit uh, when you've got an, what most people consider to be almost a perfect playing surface. Um, because even teams that on their own pitch, own grass pitches might be a bit more direct and, and play a bit, um, you know, in the, in the channels and in behind, hit the big man up front. You know, even they come and, and quite often start trying to pass the ball when they come to, to a, an artificial surface. Um, but but no, it's it's not too bad. I mean, it's, it's, and like I say, it's a great surface there. It's one of the better ones I've played on, um, and uh, you know the, the rest of the the new relatively new stadium there is is quite a, quite an impressive setup, really. Yeah, I, uh, I think everybody enjoyed it, uh, and the, and the atmosphere was great. Obviously, being a local derby for us, um, but also that obviously we like playing the passing game. Obviously, you you guys like playing the passing game, and it, and it it made for a, a great match. I thought in terms of. Uh, the passing football, obviously, uh, there's going to be some tackles going in, of course, because it's a, a local derby. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. In a, in a way, it does try and hinder people from, um, you know, doing these nasty sliding tackles and uh, they might might be more, um, you know, not going to do it as much as they would normally do in terms of that and, and, and trying to allow, you know, whatever the weather, it doesn't really matter. You can still play the, that same game, you know, that same passing style. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you, you always look at it when you, you're looking at the fixtures, and you, you you know you've got home games, and you're looking at who's coming to who's coming to play you on on which Saturday or Tuesday, and you you know you look at old Bogner at home on a Tuesday night. Well, they're going to love coming here, um, but um, but equally, obviously, with the surface that down at Nywood Lane, it, you know people have always loved going there for you know for uh, for the surface there, and you know that pitch um, is, is every bit as, as good. As in terms of a playing surface as, as any artificial, um, you know. So, yeah, it, it, it will benefit certain teams. Uh, it's becoming more and more common. So lads are playing on it, training on it more and more. Um, and and it, I think it just allows managers and players to, to approach things a bit differently because, you know, you, you can put a bit more trust in, in the way the ball is going to roll, the way the ball is going to play um, in terms of having a touch and passing it and, and all the rest of it. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's, it's probably having a positive influence on on style of play, um, but you know that said, um, you know m most supporters watching a game of football equally love watching a, a nice strong tackle or a centre half and a centre forward going up against each other um, physically. So you know you wouldn't want to lose that entirely, but um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a nice surface to play on, like I say. Oh, it's good to hear, David and. Let's take a, look, a short look back at your early career. You started off really as a youngster at Basingstoke at the age of just 16 and went on to make over 400 appearances for them over two spells with the Hampshire club. How did this experience fare for you at the time when you first started? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, all in all, over two spells, I had 11 years at Basingstoke. Um, and, and like you say, uh, just, just over 400 appearances um, all in. Uh, at the club uh, so it, it's obviously got um, in terms of looking back on my playing career it's, it's always going to have a special place in in my heart um, at the club you know it's, it's really sad what's what's happened there recently with losing the, the old Camro Stadium um, and, and kind of what they've had to go through the last couple of years has been really 
really sad to look at um, because, you know, it's, it's a sort of the old Camrose ground. You know, if, if I ever, when I've been there recently, um, even, you know, it's, it's for me joining the club at such a young age and playing so many games over so many years, it's, it's that kind of ground where I can sort of stand in the middle of the pitch and just look around at an empty stadium and, and just sort of see lots of or visualise lots of memories from the past. Um, you know, and I had a great time there. They, they gave me, you know, Ernie Howe was manager at the time, um, who, you know, really was a massive influence on, on my career. Um, and, and yeah, very fond memories. I played some great games there. Um, also had some hard times there, um, as, as all clubs do. Um, but yeah, it's, it was given me the opportunity, um, you know, to, to play first team football at such a young age. Um, you know, a, a lot of clubs, a lot of managers, you know, they, they are very reluctant to put young lads into, into a team at a competitive level. Um, so to give me that opportunity um, at, at such, such a young age, um, you know, I'll be forever grateful to, to Ernie Howe and, and the club. Um, you know, I had some great times there. Yeah, you certainly did. And in, in 2006, uh, you represented Basingstoke when they reached the FA Cup second round proper. What do you remember about this time? As I know, it's a big deal for clubs at the level of football we're at. Yes, I mean, to be to be truthful, that, that cup run, as you'd imagine, it is, is certainly one of the highlights of my career. It's, it was, um, I think, non-league players, because you, you get that opportunity um, to, to get through to, to the later rounds and and to play against some football league clubs and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, it's always at the start of a season, you always look out, when's the FA Cup start? Um, you know, and could it be our year? And you always hope that you'll have a cup run. I was really fortunate with Basingstoke. Um, obviously, in 2006, as you say, we reached the second round proper. We actually got to a replay um, as well. So we, we were in the hat for a third round draw, uh, which, which was a great experience. Um, you know, we had the Sky Sports cameras down uh, for the third round draw. Um, unfortunately, we lost the replay to Aldershot, um, local rivals. Um, but, you know, that in itself, it, it was a great experience. Um, you know, we got through to the first round via a penalty shootout. Um, and, and then Chesterfield away, they were actually top of League One at the time. And they're just not Man City out of um, one cup. I think it was a League Cup. And they'd beaten Cholton, who were championship, I think, in another, in another cup. And so they were absolutely flying. Um, and we went to them as massive underdogs. We were actually, believe it or not, we were bottom of Conference South at the time and really struggling for league form. Um, and, and we went there and, and on the day, you know, everything just kind of clicked into place. Um, we, we were we were outstanding on the day and, and deserved 1-0 winners, really, um, to, to get through. It was a great experience from start to finish. Um, and then the, the second round, you know, in a lot of ways, I think some people were thinking, oh, you know, I think Aldershot at the time were, were in the conference. Um, I think it might have been the year they won it. I'm not sure. But they were in the conference. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, surely you wanted another League One club. And it was kind of one of those. If you didn't get a big League One club, um, you know, for, for us at Basingstoke, it, you know, Aldershot away was was almost, um, you know, the, the best you could get because it was a big local rivalry. Um, and, I, and I remember there was, I think there was about four and a half, five thousand 5,000 packed in at the wreck. Uh, you had the, the cameras were all there. I think we had extended highlights on match of the day. Um, and, and obviously we were one nil up till I think it was about the 80th minute um, when, when Grant, he popped up with an equaliser, John Grant, which, you know, was a bit of a, a disappointment because we, we were nearly there. But um, but yeah, and, and if, again, like I say, that, that put us in the hat for the third round, which was a great experience. Um, and, and obviously the replay, we went one nil up in the replay, um, but, but they ended up showing their, you know, well, professionalism, if you like, you know, they had a lot of good players. They were a level above. Uh, they were full time, and you know that sort of showed through in the end. But um, but yeah, like I say, it was a great experience to to play against a League One side and beat them. Um, you know, and, and to play in front of, of a great crowd in a local rival derby match. It, it was good. It was a brilliant experience. Um, and you know, Basingstoke over the last what 15 years, they've actually done all right in the FA Cups. So I think we had another two or three first round appearances um, that, that I was able to play in there. And, and you just can't beat it and you can't get enough of it in the FA Cup because it's, it's an opportunity that you, you otherwise, you know, you, you don't get when you're in non-league. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it was fantastic. 
Yeah, it's also a terrific payday for the club at the time. Obviously, we were all shot, well supported, as you say. So actually, it was quite a good draw because whatever happens, you were going to get, you know, the club was going to get a good payout for, you know, all the TV rights and all the um, all the all the things that come with it. Obviously, the fans going paying a, you know, paying their gate money and everything else. I know they get a split of that as well. So well, this all is that it. coming I mean, together is is a, means a great great occasion for for Basingstoke at the time. Absolutely. I mean, if you just look back at it, the first round uh, proper away at Chesterfield, um, I believe from memory, there's about three and a half thousand there. Um, and then the, the, the away game uh, against Aldershot at the rec, um, you know, it was sort of four and a half, five, I think it might be five thousand people there. Um, so there was actually a lot more at that game. So if we'd have played another League One, League Two club um, away, there may have been, you know, not even as big a crowd. Um, and, and like you say, yeah, it was, it was great for the club, a bit of exposure and, and a bit of revenue off the, off the back of it. Um, you know, and actually, you know, for the, for the club at the time, probably if you get out of the, the bubble, that cup run in itself, um, you know, that led into to some great league form um, and, and saw us sort of to safety in the league. Because as I say, we were actually bottom of the league in, in December when we played Chesterfield. Um, coming out the back of, of those cup games, we, you know, we, we sort of got our act together a little bit, um, and it sort of sent us into a good second half of the season. Oh, that's that's the good thing about the cup as well. I know they they say that obviously the more cups you games you have, you might get more injuries. But again, if you get on a good run in the cup, it means it might knock on effect to your to your league form. Well, this is it. Yeah, I mean, it works both ways. If, if you if you've got a massive backlog of fixtures because of cup runs, then it can hamper your league form, but. You know, I think a lot of experiences that that I've I've been involved in and that I've seen is is that it's more a case of quite often, as long as you've got a, you don't get too many injuries and you've got a squad big enough to cope, it can often be a case where you know a, a cup run will mask your league form because you're missing a lot of games when other teams are playing. You're playing league, uh, you're playing cup games when they're playing league games, and you can actually get behind on games rather than necessarily losing every week um, and then obviously once you've exited the cup at, at whatever stage and you're playing catch up you know you, you can often take that good cup form into into the league games and when you're catching up you can you can sort of get your points in so it, it works both ways definitely yeah certainly you went on to play for Bogner, Farnborough Town and Car Short and Athletic inside three seasons playing in the then Conference South. How did you find playing at this level compared to the Ishmian and Southern League level nowadays? Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting one because obviously um, the, the stage where I came came into the side at, at Basingstoke, um, it was before they changed the non-league pyramid. So, um, you know, it was Ishmian Prem then was step two um, mm. and they were just forming... The, the conference south so uh, the early part of my career was was essentially at step two and then in the conference south the first few years it was formed um it wasn't until i actually left bogner um, and joined farnborough in, in the southern prem was sort of when i sort of experienced step three football um and i think what i would say really is that the difference in a lot of ways is um is probably the stature of the clubs um, and the professionalism um, of step two to step three can can sometimes be um, a little bit, you know, of, of, a, of a difference in maybe 50% of the clubs. Um, but, you know, it, I think consistency is, is key, but there's a lot of factors to, to come into. I mean, every, every step you go up, um, you know, the, the football ladder all the way to the very top, I, I think that there becomes more of a commitment at each level. Um, because, you know, there's more at stake um, and, and the clubs um, the, themselves are, like I say, I think the stature of the clubs at the higher levels speak for themselves and, and you kind of build on success. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you, you can play, you can play Isthmian Prem football and you would come up against a side that will, would be more than comfortable in, in Conference South, um, you know, but there's probably more clubs more consistent at conference south level is probably more the case um so so yeah it's 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 not i, th I think between step two step three is probably not the biggest the biggest jump i don't think that's the biggest gap um yeah. you know i think when you when you come to 
to probably step three to step four, I think that's maybe a bigger gap because, as I mentioned, I, I think the just the level of professionalism that, that's necessary, um, you know, to, to make that jump, the commitment um, is, a, is a big thing in non-league football. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great level to play at, that, that's for sure. And some big clubs involved in, in, in step, step two football now. Um, it's, it's a, good, a good place to be. Certainly will be. And it'd be interesting to see if Horsham, Bogner or, you know, all Worthing or Lewis, if they do go up into that conference, well, what is now the National League South, uh, how they get on and how they do there. And uh, But when you look back at uh, your, your times with Farnborough and Carshorton, is there any matches that stick out in your mind as um, fond memories? Yeah, I, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I've got some, you know, I've got games at, at every club I've been at that stick out with, with fond memories. I think Farnborough, Farnborough was a great time, um, you know, when I went there because, you know, the, the club at the time were, were very much on the up under, um, you know, under Francis Vines as manager uh, when I joined um, and, and Simon Hollis, a guy called Simon Hollis was was owner of the club. Um, and, and at that stage, they, they were really trying to build something there that was great to be a part of and, and sort of a lot of the detail that they put into to trying to make the club professional um you know it, it was it was fantastic it's, it's a great great stadium there and the surface was decent and we're pulling in good crowds and you know we spent most of that season top of the league um you know we were gutted to miss out in the end by a point to corby um i think they won something like nine or nine out of the last 10 games which is a phenomenal run um but um but yes, yeah, so, I mean, Farnborough is more of a, an accumulation of games over a season that, that saw us staying top of the league for, for most of it. Um, you know, it was it was a good time there. Um, and I think at Carshall, and uh, you know, there's a few games that stick out. We, we played Bishop Stortford, who were were National South at the time. Um, and obviously we were with Isthmian Prem. Uh, we, we played them at home. They were doing really well in the league. Um, I actually recall they had Dwight Gale playing up top. Um, who was on loan to them, um, who obviously has since gone on to to do well in the Premier League and the Championship and what have you. And yeah. and they were a good side at the time um, and, and quite fancied. And, and I think we turned them over for something like five, I think it was 5 0 um, at home. We had a, a lad up top called Byron Harrison. Um, he went on to play league football. I think he's still in the conference now. Um, you know, and, and he, he sort of ripped them apart, really. And then everything behind it was was good. So that one stood out. We, we played also when I was at Carshall and we, we had a good trophy run um, where we, we played um, Lincoln City. Uh, we played them away and drew nil-nil, got a great draw. I was actually suspended for that game, which I was gutted about, but we, we got a great nil-nil uh, and got a replay, which I played in a replay. Um, and we, we won 3-1, knocked them out. Wow. Um, and yeah, and we went on to play Newport County, I think, in the last 16. Um, the year that they got promoted from from the conference national. Um, so yeah, there, there was there was a, there's a, a number of games also at Carshall. I think at Carshall as well. Um, you know, at the time Sutton were Sutton United were in in the same league, um, and and that always used to pull in a, a good sort of two three thousand strong crowd um, for those games. So so yeah, some some great games to be involved in um, for sure, definitely. Yeah, I, I look at Sutton United as one of those teams that have really, um, you know, really grown. They've uh, they've sort of now in competing, you know, hotly in the uh, National South and National System. And they're really uh, getting some good results up there against teams that are, are, are full-time. A lot of them are full-time, obviously, set up. So they're doing really well, Sutton United. And obviously, Bogner used to have some uh, tough games there at Gander Green Lane. Uh, and I think, I think the one time I saw us win there was a 2-0 win after... A- uh, we, a bit of a bogey ground for us in the past, yeah. and finally we got result there before they went up. Uh, into it was the for me actually in a Bogner shirt going there. I, I remember um, after about twenty minutes, I, I took a, a stud stud straight in the thigh, um, and it actually ripped my thigh muscle through impact, um, and and tore me out for about eight weeks. So um, so yeah, I've got bad memories of going to Sutton as a Bogner player myself. Oh no! <laughs> but, um, but no, they but yeah, they they certainly have gone on gone on to do well, and I don't think you can underestimate the influence that um, that obviously Paul Doswell had at that club over Definitely. a sustained period. So um, so yeah. So what year was it between these spells that you joined Bogner, and can you remember your first game for the Rocks? Yeah, so I um, 
I mean, I joined Bogner um, in 2007, um, if, if I remember correctly. Um, I was, I think, just turned 22. Um, and it was my first, um, in, in men's football, it was my first move, obviously, away from Basingstoke. I'd been at Basingstoke for six years. Um, and, and Bogner was my first move. Um, and, you know, I was... I always admired the way they played. So, you know, when when they came in for me and, and sort of the, the move was on the table, um, you know, it was something that, that I was very interested in, um, obviously, hence I joined. Um, and I remember, I do remember it very well, actually. Um, I remember the first friendly that I played in pre-season was actually away to Farnborough um, at their training ground in Bisley. Um, and then we had a home fixture against Brighton um, following that. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget turning up. Although I'd played, obviously, at Nywood Lane before, I'd never forget turning up to that pre-season game against Brighton and just walking out onto the pitch. It was just phenomenal. Um, the, the surface was just, you know, unbelievable. And I stood out there with, with Michael Birmingham, Luke Nightingale and Charlie Balfe and people like that that had been at the club for years. And, and you know, even even they were walking along the pitch and, you know, they were just amazed by the, the surface. You, you just, every time you see that, you go, you go to Bognor, everyone talks about the pitch. And um, yeah, so that, that was the first, that was the first um, friendlies. And the first league game, I, I remember that quite well, actually. We played Welling United away. Um, I yeah. believe we won, it was either 3-2 or 4-3 and Dan Beck played up top and scored a hat-trick. Oh, wow. Uh, that, that's the, the, Welling's got a slopey pitch, haven't they, one end? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Parkview Road, I think it's called. But it's, it's a little bit slopey. But, um, yeah. but yeah, Beck played. We had injuries. Uh, well, throughout the whole season, we had injuries, including myself. Um, you know, suffered a, a couple of bad injuries whilst I was there, which was a shame. But, um, but yeah, we, we had injuries up top. And I remember Dan Beck played up top. And, and you know, he, he scored a hat-trick in that game. I'm yeah. sure he did. And, and he was, you know, the start of that season, he, he was outstanding up top, to be fair. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I did, like I say, I do remember it quite well, really. Oh, that's great to hear. And uh, how did it? How did joining Bognor all happen for you? And who pro- who approached you from the club? And what were your first feelings after joining the Green Army? Yeah, so um, throughout sort of the, my my Basingstoke, my first spell at Basingstoke, whenever we played against Bognor, um, I just you know anyone, well everyone you know involved at at Bognor and any Bognor fan uh, will we'll know Burmy very well, Michael Birmingham. Um, and, uh, you know, what a, what a great player he was and, and an outstanding character. And he carried that character onto the pitch, as you'll all know. And, and I often uh, would find myself playing up against Burmy um, when, whenever Basingstoke met, met Bognor in a fixture. Um, yeah. You know, he would often in whatever formation he played, he would sometimes sort of, you know, hover out slightly to the left. And, and I would either play centre, centre midfield back then or, or out on the right side of midfield. Um, and, you know, it, it'll make you laugh, but we, we often used to, to almost chat through, throughout games um, and sort of started building a little bit of a, of a, of a relationship with him, if you like. So um, Jack was the one. Jack came and watched me a couple of other times um, uh, I remember he was at Cambridge City away um, when I was playing for Basingstoke, and he, uh, I think he bumped into, he, he became aware of who my parents were, and just had a, you know, a very sort of brief chat and and sort of what have you, and it sort of said that he was a, a fan of mine, if you like, um, at, at the time, and and it, it kind of developed from there. So I was originally approached that summer um, by Jack, um, and and I had a conversation with Jack. Um, and, and, you know, I was, I was quite keen to not to leave Bainstone because I was, I was very happy there and, you know, enjoy my football. But I, I sort of felt after six years that maybe for me to develop as a player, it, it might have been the, the right time for me to, to look elsewhere and experience, you know, another club, another manager, um, other players, other styles, um, et cetera. Um, and, you know, Jack expressed an interest. We had a chat. It wasn't quite over the line at that stage and then to be truthful it was actually Michael Birmingham that, that you know he, he phoned me up and and sort of I think I might even have met up with him um, I think he came to came to my work um, you know and, and sat down with him and, and he really sort of drove home for me that it was the right decision um, for, for me to, to go to Bogner so it was a mixture it was actually a mixture of, of Jack and, and Burmy that, that got me to the club um, 
you know, and, and like I say, if I'm being 100% honest, I, I kind of, I look back on, on my, my season at Bogner and, and it was obviously the end of that season was was when, um, I think it was Mick Jenkins and, and Andy Orford and that came to the club. Yeah. Um, and, and it was like a mass exodus, really, of, of all of us. I think, I remember, I think it was Scott Harris stayed and maybe one or two others and, and everybody else moved on um, because, you know, following a, a meeting with Jack, um, you know, it was kind of outlined to us that, that the club was, you know, had other things that needed to concentrate on and they had Mick coming in, etc. And um, and I look back on my time there and, and I've got fond memories of my time at Bognor and, and I love that club. I joined the club genuinely at 22 years of age with an ambition of, you know, being able to, I was, I was hungry to try and push on and, and, and I'd love to have, have pushed on into the, the full-time game somewhere. Um, you know, from Bogner, and, and I always thought to myself, if I didn't, you know, I kind of looked at Bogner as a club that I'd have loved to have have spent the next probably ten years of my career at. Um, that, that's always how I saw it. Um, it was a great club, great setup, great fans, well supported, um, played the right football. Um, you know, the, the list goes on really. And I, and I always thought, you know, if if I can't progress from here up up the you know up through the pyramid, then you know, what a great place to play football for the next 10 years. Um, you know, so it, it was a shame the way in which it had to end, um, you know, being open and honest because of the financial um, position of the club at that particular time. Um, you know, that so much, because we had a great group there, really, and, and quite a young squad with a bit of experience. You know, it's a good blend. And, and I think that the team, the squad, definitely underachieved that year. Um, because, you know, we ended up struggling a little bit. Um, but we, we underachieved, but I think, you know, the year or two together and that, that team could have could have blossomed, I think. But um, so it was a shame the way it came to an end. And I think my only other regret, which was, was slightly out of my control, but my only other thing, my, my time at Bogner was, you know, I did suffer a, a couple of, of not very nice injuries, which kept, kept me out and limited me to, I think I made 30, 30 starts and maybe three sub appearances. So sort of 33 games. Um, yeah. you know, which which now at, at 35 sounds great, but um, but at 22 I was sort of playing 50 a season, um, yeah. you know, and and it was a bit stop start as an individual, um, but you know it, it's it's a club, you know, that everybody's got a great respect for, um, for, for many reasons that the brand of football that that's always been played there, um, the the fan base, the supporters there are great, um, you know, and and when we played. When I played for Horsham this season uh, against you guys at, at Horsham, um, you know the, the amount of travelling travelling fans for that game and, and the atmosphere created, um, you know, it's 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 a fantastic club, it really is. Yeah, I totally agree, David. And uh, as you said, you, you you obviously were before you were a midfielder going up against the likes of Burmy before you joined the Rocks. But uh, what particular positions uh, are your favourite on the pitch? Um, so, well, I think, I think as with, with a lot of players, I, I spent my whole youth and schoolboy years as a centre forward. Um, I used to play as a striker. Um, and, and there's, it wasn't until I joined Basingstoke at 16 that, that I really kind of got moved back to play centre mid. Um, when, when I joined the club, the, the youth team there, uh, which I started out in a youth team for, for a bit, was, um, you know, it wasn't the strongest. Um, so Ernie Howe was, was sort of, asked me to play centre mid um, for, for that team. And, and I kind of ended up staying there and then moving backwards. But um, so, yeah, I mean, as, as, a, as a kid, I, I loved playing centre forward. Um, but I think in, in my adult career, um, I almost think, to be honest, I, I think centre half has, has probably been, um, you know, almost a, the second best to that. I've, I've, I've enjoyed playing at, at centre half. Um, I really started doing that on a consistent basis um, when I was 24, I think I was. Um, you know, the mix just sort of from Farnborough to, to Car Shorten was when I really sort of started to establish myself more as a centre half. Um, what would so, you say is so, yeah. more? What would you say is more difficult, being a centre half or being a striker? Um, well, I suppose it's a difficult judgment because, like I say, being a striker was was my young days. Um, but you know, there, there's there's a big pressure on playing up top because you're there to score the goals. 
um, at, at centre half, you know, you, you've got a bit more, a bit more help around you, if you like. If you're in a back three or a back four, um, you know, you, you're not on your own. Um, and I'm not saying you're on your own as a striker, but obviously, like I say, you look at centre forwards. If you're not scoring at least 15, 20 goals a season, then you, you're kind of not doing your job. So I suppose there's, I suppose you, you could argue it's more difficult up top. Um, but then that that all depends who you're coming up against, really, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a top forward, um, you know, you got to be got to be on your guard. But um, but no, I, I think I think realistically, if I look back, you know, I enjoyed playing in midfield positions. Um, uh, you know, you get opportunity to score goals, and let's be honest, I don't think there's much better in football than than winning and scoring goals. Um, you know, even as a defender. Um, you know, if, if you go away somewhere, win one nil, and you've come up from a set piece and scored, um, you know, it, it's, it's what a great day. Um, but yeah, I, I think centre half certainly been my best position. Um, I, I don't think many, too many people would argue with that. No, not at all. And um, when you look back at your time with the Rocks, uh, what are your favourite memories from that time? I think, to be honest with you, it was. Um, my time at the Rocks, like I say, it was difficult. We, that season, we, we didn't really have a cup run. Um, we, we sort of ended up struggling a little bit um, and, and fighting relegation to a degree. Um, but I, th I think for me, um, it was just being involved in, in, in a great club with a great set of supporters that, that kind of backed us even when things weren't going great. And it was the group of people um, and, and the philosophy of the club, um, you know, that that really sets them apart from, from a lot of others. I mean, you've got so many clubs now that, that are trying or are playing and trying to play, you know, that, that passing game that, that Bogner are famous for. Um, but, you know, but Bogner were doing it. They, they've been always been doing it ever since I've known, um, you know, and, and what I've been told bef beforehand, you know, Bogner has sort of almost led the way and set the standards, if you like, uh, for playing a, an, an attractive form of football um so it is yeah it's it being amongst a great group of people and 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 learning from the likes of of jack and and dabber and burmy um you know it, it was we, we had some good games like i say that that first game of the season away at welling you know that that was a, a highlight i remember playing bath city away when they were doing well and we i think we beat them 3-1 um you know we, we were a bit to be truthful we were a bit hit and miss that season hence the league position um, but but there's a lot of potential there, and and it, it was just a, a great group of people to be involved with, um, you know, and and I learnt a lot from my time there for sure. I really did. Oh, that's good to know. In your opinion, who is the best player you have played with and against in your career so far, and why? Well, to be truthful, I mean this this has always been such a, a difficult question to to answer, really, um, because. Obviously, there's a lot of players that you you sort of think about, mention, and then you'll come back to it, and you'll be like, "Oh yeah, what about him? And what about him?" <laughs> um, not just saying it because I'm talking to yourself, but you know, when I played with Michael Birmingham, I think he was must have been 33, 34, maybe something like that, um, and, and you would argue that he wasn't at his peak. But I tell you, when he was probably late twenties, um, and I, I played against him, um, you know, twenty nine, thirty, maybe I played against him. I don't think there'd been too many better centre mid players than, than Michael Birmingham. Um, you know, at step two, step three level for sure. Should have played much higher. Really should have. Um, I think in terms of talent, the most talented player that I've I've played with um, was a, a lad called Dean McDonald um, when I was at Farnborough. Um, he, he was a youth at Arsenal. I think he made his debut for Ipswich in the championship at, at 17, scored. Um, you know, he, he, he undoubtedly had Premier League quality. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have an argument from anyone about that. Undoubtedly, he had Premier League quality. Uh, the things he could do with a ball, um, his ability. Uh, and he was actually, uh, when I was uh, at Farnborough with him, um, he, he went on trial at Swansea. I think it was a year they won the championship, actually. Um, and they came in with an offer for him. But the, the club were being, from what I've been led to believe, that the, the club were asking for a bit more um, and, and they, they didn't accept. And, and to be fair to Dean, he's, he's still a friend of mine. I still talk to him occasionally. 
Um, you know, he kind of, I think mentally it affected him a little bit and he kind of, in terms of looking after himself and his hunger and desire, I think he fell out of love with the game a little bit and it did affect him. But, you know, he, he was definitely the most talented player I've, I've played with. Um, Daryl McMahon was another one, again, at Farnborough. Um, and and I'd, have to, I'd have to put James Harper in, in the equation, um, you know, for... Again, he was 34 when I, when I played with him at Basingstoke. Um, but, you know, you look back on his career, um, you know, he, 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 the things that he's done in the game, the levels he's played at, and you could see that quality in him. Um, so, so, you know, like I say, it's difficult to pin someone down as, as being the best. Um, but, but, yeah, for sure. I, I think playing against, um, I played against Daryl McMahon and, and Dean McDonald, and, and they, again, they would be up there. Um, but I think early the early stage of my career, uh, when Canvey Island, they had a fantastic team, and there was a lad played centre mid for them called Jeff Minton, um, and and he always he always sticks in my memory as as being an outstanding player. Um, they had Lee Boyden up top as well; he was a goal machine. Um, so yeah, I, I think looking through my men's football career, um, you know, I, I think. Players like that are probably the, the names that you sort of start mentioning. Um, another one, actually, I would have to mention at Basingstoke that I played with was a, a guy called Kevin Gibbons, um, only for a year, but he played Premier League football for Southampton. I think he played about 30 games. Um, you know, and, and if he if he loved the game a bit more, or had a bit more hunger and desire to play higher levels, he, he would have had a, a long career sort of in the, the top two or three divisions of the country. He, he was just an incredible player. Um, I think the toughest, one of my toughest opponents, certainly playing centre half. And the last name I'll probably mention was was Jason Lee, uh, the ex Nottingham Forest forward, when he was at Corby. Um, you know, he he was he was a he was a real handful, um, big monster of a player. Um, so yeah, there's it's been some, some some loads of players that that I wouldn't have even mentioned. Um, you know, that that were really top top players. Um, but but those guys, you know, that's sort of the names that jump into jump into my head, if you like. Yeah. So in your current squad at Horsham, who would you say is your your top play, your key man at Horsham, or is it or more of a collective, um, more of a collective sort of uh, every player contributes? Yeah, I, th- I think it's difficult um, again because, as you say, I, I mean, I've only just joined the club. It's been very stop start, and and we haven't really, you know, got into our stride. Um, but we, we've got a lad, we've got a couple of lads there that, you know, have, have started the season particularly well. Um, you know, I've got a lad, Tom Day, um, who can play centre half or right back or even right wing back. You know, he, he's a talented boy. Um, has, has started the game like a house, uh, started the season, sorry, like a, a house on fire. Um, so, you know, he, he's, he's had a great start to the season. Um, and I, I think there's another lad, um, who I, I believe he might even be top top drawer in the league at the moment, uh, a lad called Charlie Harris. Oh, yes. um, you know, the, the the boy, he's he's a real talent. Um, I mean, I, whenever I see him, I, I call him the technician. Um, you know, technically, he, he's a fantastic player and a real talent. He's only young, sort of early 20s. Um, you know, he, he strikes the ball um, as well or, or better than I've seen anyone strike a ball um, in, in 19 years. He, you know, free kicks anywhere from 40 yards. You half back him to score it. You know, he, his passing range is good. Um, you know, he's like I say, he's young, so he's got a little bit to learn still. But in terms of potential, um, you know, he's one of those that you could almost um, sort of build a team around if you like. Um, if you could find a way of getting the best out of him, you know, he's he's a real talent. Um, but no, there's, there's some good players at Horsham. Um, and I think... Been quite a few changes this year from from their previous squad last year and, and maybe the year before. So there's an element of you know suffered a lot of injuries at the start. So I think we're still you know we're still yet to to really find our feet as a team. Um, but but there's potential there for sure. Um, and and, some, and like I say some some good players, good individuals. And I, I think we we will form a good team once we hopefully um, get a, an uninterrupted. Um, season and um, you know a few uh, a few weeks together, a few more weeks together as a squad to, to kind of just keep bedding everything in. Um, 
yeah, it's like I say, it's it's a good good, good players there, but um, but I think Tom and and uh, and Charlie are, are sort of talented young boys for sure. Uh, all great names, David, and uh, certainly when we played you guys at your at your place, it was uh, it was very very a tough test for us, and you had plenty of chances to to equalise and Bogner, you know, just getting that goal that they needed, and that was enough in the end. But uh, it was it was it wasn't an easy game for us by any means. And when you look back at um, so particularly uh, when you when you were a youngster, David, what, what what were the players that you sort of looked up to and, and your favourite players to watch? I mean, I used to go down um, quite regularly. I used to go down to Fratton Park. I mean, Portsmouth's my my team, if you like. And I used to go down to Fratton Park quite a lot. Um, and obviously, as, as a young lad um, at the time, playing as a forward, my, my favourite player, and I would always still answer now, my, my favourite player um, of all time was, was uh, Paul Walsh. Um, you know, he was he was a hell of a player down at Fratton and I used to love watching him play. Um, but um, But, yeah, I mean... Paul Gascoigne as well, um, you know, growing up watching him. I, I must admit the players that I used to admire, if you like, growing up and, and sort of watch and almost as, as a schoolboy try and base my, my game around, if you like, were um, they were all sort of midfield or attacking players. Um, you know, Ryan Giggs uh, was, was fantastic to watch growing up. Um, but, but, yeah, I, I think... Um, yeah, I, I think Paul Walsh and, and Paul Gascoigne were, were probably... Probably two of my idols, if you, if you want to call them that, um, to, to watch when, when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I used to just love watching football in general. Um, I used to take football everywhere with me. Um, I'd you know sit on the sofa with a football, and it'd often be a football at the end of the bed when when I went to bed at night. And I used to go and watch my dad every week. Um, you know, so so yeah, I, I just loved football and and would sort of watch it and sort of study it almost even as a kid. Um, but but yeah, I'd say Paul Walsh and uh, and Paul Gascoigne probably if I was gonna gonna chuck a couple of names out there. Great names indeed. And uh, what would you say has been your biggest achievement in football so far? Difficult um, to to answer really. I think obviously um, obviously winning the the Isthmian Prem with with Dorking a couple of years ago by by such a margin, um, you know that that was that that was definitely up there. Uh, the, the cup run, as we discussed earlier, to to reach um, you know second round replay with Basingstoke, um, yeah. you know that again that was up there. I, I think looking at it as a bigger picture, I think one of my biggest achievements, if you like, has has been you know the fact that from 17 years of age, um, you know through to through to now, so sort of into my 19th season, um, you know I've, I've generally always been um, first choice at the clubs I've been at and, and to sort of stick at, at step two, step three level for my whole career. I, I guess if I was going to be philosophical and, and look at a bigger picture, that that's probably my biggest achievement. Um, it is probably the consistency of, of staying at that level um, and being favoured by, by managers I've played for and to be in the starting 11, um, captaining teams, you know, I captain Basingstoke for a number of years, captain Carl Shorten for three years, Dorking, um, obviously, etc. So, um, yeah, I, I think amongst the, the cup runs and and winning the league and you know a couple of Hampshire Cup wins with with Basingstoke, etc. Um, I think probably the the longevity of of the career and the consistency to stay at that level is is probably um, is probably one of my biggest accomplishments, if you like. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, and. Uh... Do you, do you have time to follow any other sports? And if so, what are they and why? Um, not, to be honest, not hugely. Um, I've always enjoyed having a round of golf um, where possible. But, um, but, you know, with commitments to football, with work and, and you know, with family, um, I've, I've got three kids now. So, you know, spend most of my time, if I'm not at football or work, obviously I spend all my time with, with the family and... Um, don't get so much time now to, to enjoy other sports. Um, but, but yeah, I'd, I would say golf would have always been my go-to um, as, as an adult. I played cricket as a kid um, and, and I used to love playing cricket. Uh, but in, in truth, never a massive fan of watching it. Um, yeah. But I used, to, I used to really enjoy playing cricket. Um, so, yeah, cricket and golf, I guess. But, um, but now, yeah, nowadays, certainly with, with three kids, um, 
you know, running me ragged. Um, <laughs> yeah. You get less time to to sort of in, enjoy, you know, other sports if you like. Um, because you know, any spare minute you do get, I'm probably trying to trying to watch a game of football somewhere or get my son out in the garden to kick a ball around. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Do you see your your children following you and in, in your footsteps in terms of being a footballer? Oh, possibly. I, I don't know. I mean, my, my son, Charlie's, uh, he's six years old um, and he shows quite a keen interest in, in kicking a ball around. Um, and, and I've got two two little girls, uh, Francesca, who will be four in February, and uh, my daughter, Imogen, who's actually uh, a month old, um, a month old today, actually. So, um, so yeah, I don't know about the girls. I don't know what they'll be into as much. Charlie seems to be, you know, he, like I say, he likes kicking a ball around, but... Um, I think through my own experiences and, and the commitments from such a young age in, in football, um, I'm very conscious of, of not wanting to, to push him down that route. And I very much want it to be his, his decision. Um, if he wants to play football, then great. If he wants to do something else, then, you know, that, that's absolutely fine. So, um, you know, he's made a few noises about maybe starting to play for a team at some stage soon. So, you know, I'll support that and encourage that and, and let him lead the way. But, um, but yeah, so, so maybe we'll see. Yeah. See how it goes. Um, who were the biggest jokers in the dressing room when you're at Bogner, in your opinion? Well, I think you'd have to you straight away. You'd have to say Burmy probably. Um, Dan, Dan Beck always had a, um, a, a comical side to him, um, that, that, you know, was a bit more subtle if you like. And probably Jody Rowland, actually, um, probably Rocket and, and Burmy was, was were the two, the two at the forefront of, of any any banter going on um, in my my spell at the club, um, you know. And then we did have a good we had some good time, we did have a good laugh. Yeah, um, I, I, Burmy often comes up when I ask uh, ex players uh, about the jokers and the, the pranksters in the in the dressing room, but they often oftentimes a number have said Jody Rowland as being another one. Yeah, yeah. I mean he he's um I've not seen Jody for years, um to, to be truthful. But but you know that the, the time I had there with him he, he was he's a great guy. Um, you know, f- full of energy and, and a great character and, and the sort of sort of person, sort of character that you need around a dressing room. Um, you know, he, he was just superb. Um, and and Burmy, like I say, Burmy himself, as as you'll know, he's larger than life, um, and and he, you know, he he was great value. So, um, but yeah, Jody was probably uh, along with with Burmy and then and Dan Beck. He, like I say, he was a bit more subtle and a bit sly about it, but he had a yeah, he had his um, he had his side to him. So, but yeah, some some good guys around at, at the time. Always important, of course. And obviously, you have ex-Rocks now playing at Horsham with you, like Doug Tuck, Gary Charman, Harvey Sparks and Aaron yeah. Hopkinson recently. But do you stay in touch with any of your past teammates from Bogner? If so, which ones particularly? Yeah, I mean, to be truthful, you know what it's like. Um, I think with with social media and everything these days, it's, it's all too easy to to kind of feel like you're in touch with people um, by by liking a comment or you know, commenting on something on Facebook, for example. Um, and, and you know, you, you get so carried away and busy with life. You, you don't probably speak to people and catch up with them as much as you should. But I'd say over the years, um, again, Burmese probably one that I've, I've sort of spoken to every now and then. Um, you know, not on the regular, but every now and then. Um, bumped into to Chris Breach every now and then in and around Brighton and played against Dan Beck a couple of times. Um, but yeah, like I say, I, th- I think it's quite sad, really. But you, you get a little bit lazy with with social media these days, where you know you'll, you'll keep up a little bit with what people are up to um, and sort of chuck a like on their their comments or their pictures or whatever. Um, but um, but yeah, like I say, there's some some good guys there um, for sure. Yeah, that's uh, even even hitting a like it shows that you're you're, you're keeping an eye on uh, on, on what's going on in their lives. Yeah, and... I think... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, another lad actually, you get to see quite a, a bit through um, through social media. And I mean, what what a, a career, if you like, that he's gone on to have, and an experience because he's gone on to have is um, obviously Chris Greatrich. Um, oh yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know, he he was there that season. Another very talented player actually, and he every now and then he'll chuck a picture on of him playing um, for the Philippines against LA Galaxy and David Beckham and Robbie Keane. 
in, in the background. And, you know, I think he, had a, he might even have had a spell as manager or coach of the national team. And, you know, so when you see stuff like that chucked on social media, I mean, I'm not, I'm not seeing Crispy for years, um, you know, but um, you, you see stuff like that chucked on there. It's, it's nice to see players that you were involved with, which now obviously was, was such a long time ago, um, you know, go on to do so well. In, in all sorts of things and, and not just football you know in, in everyday life um, people are doing really well with stuff so um, so yeah it's, it's, it's good it, it's, it's a good avenue but I, like I say I do think sometimes it can make you lazy um, yeah. social media can make you lazy in terms of of um, you know staying in touch with people and you know having a proper proper relationship with them if you like yeah definitely and uh uh, obviously, obviously uh, I always ask the same question to all, all the players. Uh, what do you love most about our football club at Bognor Ridges Town? I know you're at Horsham at the moment, but uh, what do you love? What did you love most about our club at, at the time you were with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've probably touched on it already, but um, but the fan base uh, there and, and the passion of the supporters. You know, the, the club's been through um, you know some tough times o- over the last sort of ten, fifteen years that that you know I've been more aware of. of of non-league football and, and Bogner, etc. Um, you know, with, I remember when the clubhouse burnt down, and and then you you know you new the new stand that's up now. But you, you've always got such a, a core of of um, of supporters there that that really sort of pitch in at, at the club and, and make it what it is. Um, so you know, it's it's just a great club, and and um, you know. I think you're very, very fortunate if you get opportunity to, to play down at Bognor, um, not just on that surface, uh, but, you know, it's a nice stadium and, and in front of the fans down there. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a great club um, for, from top to bottom. And, and I think a club that, you know, I'd, I'd like to say, you know, are, are on the up again, um, in, in my opinion. I think someone with, um, you know, with, with Robbie Blake's experience to, to be involved um, and, and, you know, Jack, who, who literally, um, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, and he's put he's put his whole life into that club. Um, you know, I, I think you've got a good crop of, of young players. When we played you guys um, earlier in the season, you know, um, some may say you, you've lacked some consistency at times um, in the, the games we have played this year. But you've got some real talented boys there, and and I, I'd like to think the club are on the up again. So. Um, so, yeah, it's a great club, fond memories, um, and, and always enjoy going back there, for sure. Yeah, I always think it would be great if uh, all of us in this sort of area, this county, can get into, the, at least into the playoffs and uh, really have a, you know, with all the restrictions lifted, hopefully by the end of this, you know, the end of the season, we can have a really good, you know, some local derbies there that can really, uh, really generate, yeah, you know, absolutely. a bit of excitement. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you can't beat a lo- local derby game. Um you know the atmosphere that it generates and and everything is 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 what it's all about. It's what we play for. Um, so yeah, it'd, it'd be fantastic if if you could have, you know, a, a sort of strong Sussex contingency, if you like, uh, within the same division, all fighting for the same thing. Um, you know, it it makes great for for the clubs, the players, and the supporters alike. So um, so fingers crossed. Yeah, certainly. And it's now time for the quick fire rocks players round. Instead of direct choices between players like we do with fans, I want you to just give me the name of the first Bogner player that springs to mind. Your choice is at the ready, David, OK? Are you ready? I'll give it a go. Here we go. Best dressed. Chris Breach. Most serious. Mm. Mark Nee. Biggest appetite? Probably me. <laughs> they might not know that. <laughs> <laughs> Best athlete? Dan Beck was a good athlete. Most scruffy? Craig Stoner. Best friend? Michael Birmingham, i say. Most reliable? Charlie Balf. Most skillful. Darren Budd. Best passer. Mark Birmingham. 
best crosser? Alex Haddo. Best hairdo? <laughs> Alex Haddo. <laughs> <laughs> best beard? Now, this, was, this one was uh, tricky for most players. Yeah, best beard. I'm not sure if I remember many beards back then. Yeah, I'm not sure. Stoner might have grown a beard every now and then, but yeah, I'm not sure I remember many beards back then. It wasn't so fashionable then. <laughs> no. It is now, though, isn't it? It seems to be. It is, certainly is now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not for me. I can't grow one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best attitude? Uh, Mark Knee. Okay. Uh, biggest bookworm? Oh, I'll go for Charlie Balfe just because he just looks so intelligent. <laughs> Most nervous before a game. That's a tricky one. I'll go for Tom Broadbent just purely because he was so young when he started playing. He was—I remember him being a bag of nerves before one game. <laughs> he sixteen or seventeen when he played for us. He was I think. sixteen, I think. Yeah, yeah. sixteen. Unbelievable. Um, most uh, sorry, best striker. I'll go. I will go for Luke Nightingale. Yeah. Best midfielder. Michael Birmingham. Best defender. Let's go, Duncan Jupp. Oh, I remember him. Best goalkeeper. Yeah. Craig Stoner. Yeah. Best coach. Dabba. And one best... of the best coaches I've worked with. Yeah, and um, best football mind. I'll go with Michael Birmingham again. Okay, great answers. I've heard you were a car dealer in your work away from football. Is this true? And is it as cutthroat and difficult a profession as they say it is? Uh, yes and yes. Um, it's one of those, really, isn't it? It's it's um, it depends on the demand, um, you know, and and. It's not at the moment. There's a lot of competition in within the market. So, um, you know, being able to buy good stock at the right prices as to what you can sell it at due to the competition is it's not an easy game. Um, but you know, you, you can have very good weeks, very bad weeks. But um, but you know, I've I've been buying and selling cars now for twelve years, um, and and my dad's been doing it for. Um, it, it's, it's something I enjoy because it gives me the flexibility for football um, it can be difficult at times especially during lockdown periods when you're not allowed to open your forecourt um, yeah. but um, but yeah no it's it's, it's good fun you, you know I, I try and approach it in, in a manner that um, that I'm kind of I've, I've got I've got stock advertised if somebody wants to come and look at it I just try and um, you know build a relationship with with the customer and 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 just kind of let the car sell itself so of meeting people if you like and and supplying what they want definitely it's, it's good fun yeah i know you've been nicknamed razor particularly by teammates and other clubs where does this nickname originate is this a play on your surname so it, it's definitely yes yeah it's a play on my surname um but believe it or not where that I sort of really properly picked up the nickname um, was at Bogner, um, believe it or not. And it came from Michael Birmingham. And I think it was a slight, um, I don't know if, it, if you'd say that it was a mis mishearing by the other lads or whether it was just a, a progression. But I remember when I first joined pre-season, he was calling me, obviously my surname being Ray, he was calling me Raya. Oh. Um, literally, yeah, and, and then I think a few of the other lads kind of heard that, thought he was saying Razor, um, and and it kind of just stuck from there, and and so it was it was a Michael Birmingham one really that that sort of that created that um, back when I was at Bogner, um, wow. and and ever since you know it's got to a point now you know <laughs> where a lot of players that I'll, I've played with over the last ten years or so you know that'd be like. I forgot your name was Dave. Like I've, <laughs> I, you only ever hear anyone call me Razor. So, um, so yeah, so that was that was actually, that came from Bogner and, and Michael Birmingham, really. Yeah. 
Well, goals are a, a, a real bonus as a defender playing for any side. Could you describe your personal favourite goals for any of the clubs you have represented over the years? Yeah, so I think there's um, there's a there's a couple that spring to mind. Um, obviously, um, bearing in mind in my earlier career, I played quite a lot of games in midfield. So, um, you know, I did score a few goals back in those days. But um, I remember Newport County away for, for Basingstoke. I was about 19, I think, 19, 20. I was playing St. Mid and I drilled one in the bottom corner from about 25 yards. And, and you know, anyone that's played Newport County away will know that it, it can be quite hostile there, if you like. Yes. Um, and and they were quite an aggressive bunch of fans and they make quite a lot of noise and, and they were being, you know, quite loud and, and, um, and like I say, it, it was, it was a, a good atmosphere and, and I've drilled one in the bottom corner from distance and uh, about the 85th minute uh, to make it one nil to us. And the whole ground just went silent. Um, obviously there was, there was less Basingstoke fans say that the whole stadium just went silent the minute that ball went in the bottom corner so that sort of sticks out as, as a bit of a memory um, and, and then I had uh, had a couple of others um, that, that sort of sort of stick in my mind a little bit um, particularly for Basingstoke a couple of nice sort of strikes from from distance in the top corner and, and one at home to St Albans I remember a left sided cross I was playing right midfield coming in at the far post um, a lad called David Stroud crossed one in from the left and, and it was really sort of high and loopy um, and I was probably just come inside the 18 yard box on an angle I just watched it all the way down and I hit it first time on the volley without touching the ground and it just flew straight in the top corner um, you know so in terms of technical strike um, and quality of goal that, that was probably uh, probably the best one um, I, I think so um so yeah, but I've, because of my early days playing midfield, especially, I've I've been fortunate to have scored a few goals um, over my career, and and like I, I think I mentioned it earlier in in the chat, you know, you, you can't beat that feeling of of scoring um, on on a football pitch. Not at all. Um, what kinds of uh, music are you into? What gets you pumped up for a game these days, if anything? So I've I've actually got um, you know, I've got. My main interest in music is probably R and B, hip hop, is is probably my my favourite music, my go to music, if you like. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm I'm quite predictable in that sense, where you know I, I, I like a lot of Drake's music. Um, you know, I, I like a bit of Maybach music, uh, Rick Ross, and, and things like that before a game. That's my kind of thing, if you like. Um, but I'm not, um, you know, I'll go with anything. I've got quite a, an open mind on music. You know, sometimes I'll be at home doing the washing up, listening to a power ballad. I'm, I'm not, um, you know, stick some country music on. I, I can appreciate all kinds of music personally. Um, you know, so I've got quite an open mind when it comes to music. But, um, but yeah, hip hop bar and is is probably where, where I'd pitch myself at if, if, if I was sort of asked uh, for, for one, one answer only. OK, uh, you joined Dorking Wanderers before arriving at Horsham following the COVID outbreak. What was the reasoning behind joining Dorking and how did the move go for you at the time? So actually it was, um, I was approached by uh, Mark White uh, a year earlier than I joined. Um, he, he sort of inquired about my availability um, and I just signed, I, I decided to sign a two year deal at Basingstoke when and they changed their strategy slightly and they went younger and they went full time for a couple of years. Um, and within that, I mean, obviously at my age with my own business, I could be flexible, but I, you know, I, I had my priorities um, with, with a young family and that. So I was only doing two mornings a week. Um, but I, I, I sort of first spoke to Mark then. Um, and in the following year, uh, the, the owner of, of Basingstoke sort of left Rafi. He, he left the club and pulled his money out. Um, and I still had a year on my contract, but um, although Dawkins had come back in again, um, and they'd already spoke, they did speak to Basingstoke as well about my availability. And, and Terry Brown said, like, you know, no, not available. He's important to our plans, etc. Um, so he kind of put the, the kibosh on it at that stage. Um, but then with Basingstoke's um, unfortunate money issues and everything else, um, you know, they sort of were going to struggle to, to honour my contract. It wasn't just me. Um, there was, you know, another lad, Matt Partridge, 
um, you know, and, and one or two others that were on uh, slightly better deals, if you like, than, than the young boys, uh, sort of the experienced players. Um, and, and yeah, so I spoke to, I had a long chat with Terry Brown and, and David Knight, who was sort of um, looking after a lot of things at the time at Basingstoke. And, and, uh, and I said, OK, well, they gave me permission to speak to other clubs. So I, I sort of spoke to Mark and I said, look, things have changed drastically at Basingstoke and I may be available. Um, and, and we just had a chat. And I think the link between myself and Mark and, and the club at Dorking was, um, was an old teammate and a good friend of mine, Tom Davis, um, who, who's a mutual friend. He, he had a, a short spell at Dorking himself uh, when they were arriving south. But he, he was he's good friends with Mark. And, and he was, um, I think he kind of put my name in really to, to Dorkin and said, look, you know, you should sign my mate Razor. Um, and, and that's kind of how it progressed from there, really. Um, and obviously, bearing in mind location, um, talking to Mark with plans for a new stadium and the ambition that he had and their record of, of success. Um, a few players there that I was aware of, like Giuseppe Sol, um, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it just seems like, the right move at the right time and and in all honesty it, it definitely worked out that way um so yeah i had a good time there yeah um obviously it's a very successful there and um you played alongside i think jimmy muet sammy el abd and jason Pryor, who are all doing well there from what from what i understand and then um how was your time playing with those guys yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's, it's funny actually. At one stage, you, we, you know, all there together, and even now, as as you, as you mentioned, those players, uh, Wes Fogden's there now, um, who obviously he and I was there. Um, in fact, going back to one of your other quick fire questions about the fittest, um, it's probably Wes Fogden now. Come to think about it, but um, but um, yeah. So um, you know, there's, there's there's been a strong contingency of of ex Bogner players at Dorking. Um, and, and it was, you know, it's, it was great playing with those guys. You know, I had um, a couple of years with Sammy and, and JP. Jimmy came in um, a bit later, but I remember playing for Dorking against Bogner. Um, and I said after that game to, to I think I said it to, to Mark and a couple of the players, I said I'd, I would try and sign that Jimmy Muir if, if, <laughs> if, I, was, um, if I had an option because he was very impressive on the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, those guys, they're good players. More importantly, they're good people um, and, and they're doing really well at the moment. I mean, JP's absolutely flying. Um, yeah, you know, he's top he's scorer, isn't he, sport. for them? Uh, yeah, I think he's he's on nine or ten already. He's yeah. sort of two goals a game. He's, he's absolutely flying. Um, no surprise, really. I mean, his pedigree, his track record, um, you know, he, he is a, a goal scorer and he's, he's outstanding at, at, at step two level. He, he could easily play higher. But at step two level, he's he, you know he's there's not many better. You're not going to find many better than JP at, at step two, that's for sure. Um, and and Sammy, I mean you know you've got to take your hats off to Sammy because he's missed the whole of last season pretty much, uh, having done a cruciate. Mm. Um, and and recently was was back in the starting eleven for Dorking when they played. I think it was um, who they played was it Bath at home or you know they played a, whoever they played in the evening um, at a home fixture on a Tuesday night, and he was back in the starting eleven. So. Um, yeah, he's you know you you got to you got to take your hats off to him for that because at, you know early thirties it's it's not easy to come back from from that type of injury. Um, but yeah, great lads like I say, um, and and good to see him doing so well. Yeah, Bogner fans are following all, all that they do uh, wherever they go, and uh, you were named captain at Dorking and helped them uh, help steer them to promotion to National League South. How was this time for you? And it must have been a, a really good time to be a part of that. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, if you're involved in, in a team, in a club that are being successful, um, it, it makes everything better, doesn't it? Um, and, and to, you know, to be to be captain throughout that period, I mean, to be fair, in the end, um, I, I essentially ended up sharing that captaincy, if you like, with Sammy, um, you know, which in itself was was a privilege. Um, he's, he's a real leader. But, um, but I obviously I had my first season at the club. Um, and I, I was sort of vice captain, if you like, to to Chris Bolter. And when Chris Bolter um, sort of he was sort of moving a little bit more towards the player coach role, if you like, and, and wasn't so much first choice during the, the year we run won the Ryman Prem. Although when he played, I would say he still he still played very well. He was a good player. But um, but I was kind of 
named captain, if you like, at the start of that season. I was unfortunate to get an Achilles injury that kept me out for a little while. And whilst I was out, Sammy then obviously took over the armband for a bit. So um, second half of that season, we, we kind of shared it in a sense. I was viewed as a sort of club captain and, and Sammy would sort of be captain on the pitch um, on a Saturday. And then we, we lifted the trophy together at the end of the season um, and, and sort of carried that into the next season. But then with Sammy being the one injured through the whole season, um, obviously I'd be the one wearing the armband in our first season in Conference South, um, sort of on the pitch as well as being club captain off it. But um, but yeah, no, it, it was, listen, like I say, it was, it was a great time. I mean, the, the first season, they were getting a lot of foundations in place with the new stadium at, at, at Meadowbank. Um, and, and it was a mid, mid-table season. Um, and, and the next season with a few additions, um, inclusive of, of Sammy and obviously Jason Pryor, um, et cetera, um, you know, we, we really kicked on and, and to, to win the, the Isman Prem by the, the, the gap that we did. I think it was, 20, was it 22 or 24 points in the end. Um, we ended up winning it by. And, and it was it was a great to be a part of. It really was. It was a, a pleasure to play in that team. Um, but, but, you know, Dorking, Dorking's a great club. It, there's a lot a lot of talk. People talk about Dorking and, and old oh, Mark's just got loads of money and splashes of cash. But if you, if you got chance to be experienced experience the inside of that club um that the, the time and effort and blood sweat and tears that's put into that club by by mark um you know and and all the others behind the scenes um you know that that club has been built from the ground up um and, and in my opinion having been on the inside it deserves everything you deserve everything they get at that club because you know there's a lot of passion gone into it and, and a lot of time money effort um, it's, it, and you know that that's shrewd the shrewd businessmen there as well there's a lot of sponsors at the club it, you know it's not mark dipping into his pocket um you know every, all the time to sign his players they've got good sponsors um and it's it's just a progressive club and and like i say i had three great years there um a, a pleasure to have been a part of it um and and i i really wish them well for the for the future because as, like i say i think they that they, they deserve their success because of the work that goes in. Same as any other club, you know. Um, so, so yeah, good time there. That's great. And I, I, I think recently they, they played off in a semi-final. Uh, you were with them at the time in the playoffs. Uh, we at Bognor yeah. know a lot about playoffs and how cruel they can be. How was your experience and what is your view on the playoffs in general? Yeah, I mean, I mean to be honest with you, if, if you wanted my honest opinion, I, I actually believe that with the the coronavirus and everything that, that was going on at the time, I'm not so sure personally the playoffs should really have been played. Um, but, you know, as they, as they were, it, it was, it was strange to be, to be involved with really, because, you know, behind closed doors with no fans there, um, et cetera, it, it certainly, it certainly took a bit of a, an, an edge off of the occasion, if you like. Um, it's still, uh, you know, painful losing, um, but it, it was such a long break between the last league game in March um, to then playing those playoff games. It was such a long break, and then we, with no no crowd there, etc. Um, you know, it it felt it felt a bit bizarre, if if I'm honest. Um, but but nonetheless, obviously, to miss out on on promotion uh, when when the opportunity is is there, you know, and you're so close, literally, you know, two wins away from a promotion, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always hard to take. Um, as, as you've rightly pointed out, you, you know that from your own experiences um, at, at Bogner. So, yeah, for sure. It's, it, but it was, it was great to be, to be a part of it. The club's first season at that level to have made the playoffs, albeit um, on a points per game. And in the end, you know, it, it was on merit because, as I say, the, the games that were played and then they averaged it out and points the game and, and we nicked that last spot. So, um, yeah, I, I think if anything, for most people involved in those playoff games, it, it was a relief to, to get back to football. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, it, was, it was good to see that, uh, you know, Dorking had such a meteoric rise, really, in terms of, uh, you know, moving up the leagues and and the new stadium, as you pointed out, was impressive. The, I think that the head of the, uh, the Surrey FA is based there as well. Is that right? Right. That's correct, yeah. yeah. No, so it's really impressive, and uh, yeah, uh, and 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 what the the decision to get eventually to go to, jo- to to join Horsham recently, 
was that helped by them wanting to wanting to integrate you in as a coach as well as a player there? Yeah, it definitely helped. I mean, it, it, again, I'm I'm sort of quite happy to be honest about it. Um, you know, I I phoned I phoned Mark, um, and this was actually before the playoffs because at the time we didn't think playoffs were going to happen. Uh, and, and Mark sort of sent a message out saying that he was going to speak to everyone about next season, regardless of playoffs, etc. And and I'd done a I'd, I'd done a lot of thinking, um, you know, over the last year really, um, or more. And, and I phoned him up and I said that you know I, I felt the time was whether or not he'd offered me another deal or not. I, I honestly don't know. He, he's the only one that could tell you that. Um, but um, because I did suffer a few injuries in the last couple of years. Um, but, but, you know, I, I approached him and said that I thought it was the right time for me to move on. Um, and, and I said to him, to be true, I said, look, I, I don't know for sure what I'm going to do. I don't know if I might sort of knock it on the head and retire now um, or, or whether there might be another opportunity and project out there for me. Um, I said, I don't know. I'll wait and see. Uh, it was at that point that he said that he had actually already had an inquiry from from Dom de Paola at, at Horsham about my availability. And, and he just said to me, he said, look, he said, um, you know, before you make any decisions, he said, just have a chat with him, see what he says, see what you think, um, and, and sort of go from there. He said, Dom's a good guy. It's a great club down at Horsham and he, et cetera. So, you know, that call came. I, I had four or five lengthy phone conversations with Dom. And I said to him, look, you know, I'm, I am thinking about knocking it on the head and calling it a day. Um, and, and the more conversation that went on. And, and I said, you know, if I was to continue playing, really, I, I would be looking at, you know, getting a, a bit more experience and a bit more on the inside of the management side of the game. Because that's something that I, I may decide to explore once I, I do stop playing. Um, and, and, you know, after a few more conversations, he said, you know, well, I, I think I can offer you that opportunity, uh, bring you here as, as player coach and, and sort of, as, as I mentioned earlier, really, as, as my time there gets longer and, and, you know, I settle in more and more and the club's more familiar with me, I'm more familiar with the club, I can hopefully get involved more. And, yeah, it was definitely a key reason um, to, to, to go to that club. Um, but also, like I say, um, to be offered that opportunity as a player coach, um, a club that's 15 minutes down the road in the Ryman Prem with such a good fan base, such a good setup. an opportunity that I, I couldn't turn down um so so yeah no oh, so that's that's all great and um do you see that as a natural transition into full-time coaching at some point and what are your plans for the next say five years yeah so i think um from a playing perspective i, I think it's very much when, when you get to 35 um and and you know you, you've suffered a few injuries and you've played a lot of games um I think it's it's smart just to not look too much further than uh, the next week or two, um, and and sort of just take it as it comes. So I'm I'm not I'm not making plans from a playing perspective for the next five years. I, I don't see myself reaching you know the, the Gary Sharman stage of football. <laughs> I think he's due to turn forty in in the next month or two. Wow. Um, incredible, incredible from him, um, and and what a great guy he is too. But. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see myself going that far as a pl as a player. But um, I think equally, you, you have to and you want to play as long as you possibly can because, as everyone says, you know, you're you're a long time retired, and and even though I'm still playing, you know, after my nineteenth nineteenth season now, I can I can vouch, it's true what they say. You, you, time goes quick, and your career's gone in a flash. Um, in terms of the natural progression, um, I think what I'm probably learning already through my time. Uh, you know, the last couple of years at Basingstoke, through my time at Dorking and, and now at Horsham, is I've, I've probably got a keener interest um, long term you know, from from maybe a management point of view rather than um, being an out and out coach. Um, but um, but yeah, whether or not it's going to be a natural progression, we'll, we'll see on that. I, I think timing's key. Um, you know, what's what's a, what's around at the time. Um, you know when you're looking for your first job as a novice, it's who's going to back you and who's going to, um, you know, give you the opportunity. Much like when I was, I was a youngster at Basingstoke and Ernie Howe gave me a chance to play in the first team. Um, it's the same as a manager, you know, you, you need a, an owner and a board of directors that will give you the chance. Uh, will that chance come up? Where will it be? Will it be the right club? Um, 
I think it's something that I, I possibly want to, to have a go at um, once I do stop playing. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of factors to consider, I think. Um, and I'm, I'm open minded to, to see to see where my future takes me. But um, one thing's for sure is spending your whole life in football. Um, the idea to then walk away from it completely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that's something that that uh, that sits too comfortably. That sort of sends a shiver up my spine, really. So, um, so yeah. You, I, 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 you see yourself as always being involved in some way. Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I think, um, I think I'd, I'd like to think so. Yeah, um, certainly to start with for 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 a period. But then, you know, that that equally that that can just be, um, you know, that might progress. You know, as we mentioned earlier, if my son starts playing football, it, my involvement in the game might actually end up being ferrying him around the country much like my dad did with me yeah um you know but but at the moment um you know i i think having having a go at at management is is possibly um on the radar in in a couple of years time um if if the right opportunity comes up like i say timing's everything if the right opportunity doesn't come up i think you you can get forgotten about quite quickly Mm. um in football um and because you know people move on things move on um, and uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. We'll have to wait and see. I'm I'm sort of a bit of an open book, really, and, and see what opportunities arise. If you could give a, a piece of advice to 16 year old David Ray right now, what would that advice be? Um, difficult question. Um, I think I think if there was one thing that I would probably that the one bit of advice I'd give myself was to probably look further into the future when it comes to, to injuries. Um, now, I've been fortunate enough, um, well, I've been unfortunate to, to have had a, a few injuries that haven't been great. Um, injuries are never great. But, um, but you know, I, I've actually amassed over 750 games um, in my career. So I've played a lot of football and I've been fortunate on that front. But if I look back... Um, you know, the injuries I've had over the last three, four years, um, you know, who knows? Maybe they, I wouldn't have suffered those so much if I didn't um, play through bad injuries when I was younger. Because, you know, I remember as a 17-year-old, I had three ruptured ligaments on the inside of my ankle um, and I had a, a, a piece of bone um, broken off of the, the talus bone um, on a Saturday. Three days later, we had all the shot at home. Um, and that was going to be my first derby match. And there was, you know, about two, two and a half thousand people there. And I hadn't experienced a crowd like that before. I was so desperate to play. My ankle was humongous, but I just got it taped up and played. Um, you know, the, the longer term damage um, to, to that ankle, you know. So I think, that, yeah, the point I'm getting at, I suppose, is the advice I would give is, you know, there'll be more games like that in the future. Um, so look after your body um, would, would probably be... Um, you know, less games at the start might mean more games at the end. Um, uh, that would probably be my piece of advice um, yeah. to, to myself. I've, I've always, you know, if I was advising other 16-year-olds, it would always just be enjoy your football as much as you possibly can. Commit as much to it as you want to. If, if it's not for you, don't feel like you have to do it. But if you love football the way I did, just give everything you've got to it for as long as you can, because you can't play forever. That's for sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I think just, but football's there to be enjoyed, um, you know, as much as you can as well. So um, just give everything you've got, I think, and, and don't have any regrets. Um, I could offer that injury advice to myself as, as a 16 year old, but I, I don't, you know, I don't look back with regrets. Um, that, that's for sure. So, um, so yeah, I think that's probably probably the answer to, to the question. Yeah, and I was going to, you kind of answered that question that I was going to go on to. I saw obviously any tips for young players coming up, but it's basically just enjoying it, make sure you enjoy it and put your whole self into it. Yeah, I, I think, like I say, that the biggest, the biggest thing is don't regret anything. Um, you know, don't be, I used an example earlier, um, you know, Dean McDonald, most talented player that I've come across in non-league uh, without a shadow of a doubt. And, and he, he had Premier League quality, but the effect, and I can understand it, but the effect that that 
move to Swansea not coming off um, be, because supposedly because Farnborough were asking for to too much money, um, you know, and he felt cheated out of the move, essentially. The effect that that had on him, uh, you know, when he was, I think, 23, 24, um, you know, I, th- I think that affected the next 10 years of his career. Um, you know, and he's, it, I'm glad to say he's in a great place now, um, you know, in, enjoying, I think he's coaching and, you know, he was playing for England, um, you know, futsal and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I just think enjoy it. Don't have regrets um, because it's, it's, you, you know, your, your career has gone in a flash. Um, so, so you, you've got to just give it everything you've got and enjoy it um, while, while it's there for sure. Here, here on that. And final question, David, I know a lot of rocks fans listen to this podcast. So what would be your final message to Bogner fans to end this interview at this time? I think really just, um, you know, just be you. Just keep doing what you do. Because like I say, the, the, the fans down at Bogner, um, through good times, tough times, that they've always stuck by the club and they've always stuck by and supported the players. Um, you know, everybody uh, involved at that club wants the best for the club. So just, just stick together and enjoy it. Um, you know, this coronavirus break has probably reminded us all how much we love football and and when it's taken away from you, um, you know, how much you want it back. So a bit like the players, really, just enjoy it as much as you can. Um, and, you know, from a personal point of view, um, you know, I had a great time um, and, and was always well supported. So, you know, as, as, as an opportunity all them years down the line to say thank you for that. Thank you. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's a great club that I, I hope and, and think are, are on the up again. So um, up the rocks. Up the rocks indeed. And David, many thanks for joining me today and getting to learn more about your footballing career has been interesting for me. And I appreciate you taking the time. I have to thank uh, good friend Kenneth Wood for, for organising this, this, uh, this, helping me to organise this interview. I know for a fact, Rocks fans are watching how Horsham will do this season, including all watching all Rock, ex-Rocks players who now play for the Hornets. All being well, we will be able to return to football with another lockdown hit in the nation recently. But we will rise above this and, and uh, cheering on the Green Army to victory. Obviously, cup games, you know, still happening. But again, a big thanks to our sponsors, Mitchell's Travel. Call them today on 01243 939 555 and quote Rocks 1883 to help the football club whilst getting a great deal. Until next time, this has been an On The Rocks podcast production brought to you by the BRTFC Supporters Club. Stay safe. Up the rocks.